Thank you so much for being here with us today, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really excited to dive into this topic as so many people can, can probably relate who are watch, watching or listening right now. We all get stressed out in life and stress seems to be an even bigger problem these days than it, than it seems to have ever have been. So, so let's talk about stress and I guess just its prevalence first off. Like what, What's your experience with, with stress and how prevalent it is today? So it's very interesting that uh, stress is probably... It's a wildly overused word, but it's probably uh, the most underexposed risk factor for all probably health conditions and a massive impact on anti-aging and and longevity. It has a massive impact on longevity. And you can break uh, sort of stress down. And I focus on early life stress, uh, childhood stress, because it's your experience in childhood impacts how you how much stress you have in adulthood so it's your early life experience which is going to define whether you are very a very stressed adult or not so how we respond to events that happen in our adulthood is often set up by our experiences in childhood so that when i talk about stress and i talk about the prevalence of stress i always focus on the childhood experience because that's going usually sets up the adult experience as well and there's a famous study, I always talk about it, it's worth to get the word out about it. I don't know, you may have heard about the adverse childhood events studies, yes. which ACEs. were huge studies. Yeah, the ACEs studies. And I always just mention, especially in the context, the context of anti-aging, because the adverse childhood events studies were done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, so it was mainstream science. It was over 17,500 adults. They started in the mid-1990s, and there's tons of studies that have come out since then. And essentially, they were just looking at uh, the, the correlation of early life stress with adult onset chronic illness and you know early death basically and they found that if you had a dramatic if you had a high level of aces adverse childhood events you have a dramatic increased risk of seven out of the top 10 causes of death if you had just six aces you had a 20 year reduction in lifespan straight to the anti-aging and the the longevity aspect if you had just four aces you have a 400 percent increased risk of things like depression alzheimer's all the mental health conditions chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia like the poster children there's like six-fold increased risk of those types of things if you have early life stress so when we talk about aces what are we what do we mean by that Uh, by the way 67 percent of all adults reported that they had at least one ace that was probably a massive underestimate because there's also what we call like silent aces. So um, there's obviously overt trauma and stress. So you can think about things like, you know, physical, sexual or emotional abuse. Uh, But there's things like physical, emotional neglect that are epidemic, but vastly underreported. Because often as children, how do we know that we have experienced emotional neglect we often it's not something you self-report you know you kind of don't realize that you might there are actually symptoms of it and you might think there's something wrong with you and then it's like no you've actually experienced emotional neglect oh okay so um even in that ac study it was it was, it was a landmark study one of the most important studies done in medicine but it was also quite superficial because they they were asking so many people and you know you kind of a lot of people would have said wouldn't have said the truth either so 67 percent is probably more like everyone <laughs> has had some level of stress um parents separating or divorce is another ace um uh, things like incarceration of a family member um uh, substance abuse in the family there was like 10 categories but there's also things like you know being bullied at schools or being um subject to things like homophobia and other types of um like being shunned and ridiculed at school things like that um so there's basically you also there's something called intergenerationally inherited trauma Mm -hmm. which is basically they've shown absolutely in the science that what happens to your parents changes the epigenetic expression of the dna and we can inherit that we actually inherit the expression of the dna we don't sort of just go back to zero and start with a clear set of dna we actually inherit uh, what happens to our parents so that's been shown with things like um, third generation survivors of the holocaust have the uh, victims have the same psychological and physiological expression of symptoms as their grandparents. So 
for people listening, if you're already thinking about, gets everybody thinking, have I got any ACEs? Also ask parents and grandparents. So it's also in utero. What was happening to mum when she was pregnant with you? Was she stressed? Was she depressed? Was, you know, what was her life like? So uh, basically it's hardly anyone gets away with, not, you know, you come and incarnate on this planet and you, it's part of the reason to be here is to transmute that, right? And to, to recognize it. So, uh, so prevalence, massive massive impact on health across a lifetime um which has been mainstream science proven so this is one of what's could be this is probably one of the most important if not the most important i would put it above toxins as a cause because everybody thinks it's toxins it's, i think this is number one most underexposed risk factor for health but well-being mental health physical health and anti-aging mm. Yeah, it's yeah. When we were just chatting before we started the interview about one of our last master classes, which was healing from childhood trauma, which is when I really started to get an understanding of ACEs and um, people's ACEs scores and just how crazy it is. To, first of all, how many people have like so many ACEs, and next of all, just just what kind of effect it can have on your life, on your career, on your relationships, on your health, on your aging, on your, I mean, you name it, it's it's paramount. So I'm I'm so glad that that you're talking with us about it. So so how is it that the stress that we experienced in childhood, right? Let's say you know trauma. How is that 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 I guess, affects our ability to age more quickly or slowly as we become adults. Yes. So this is really good. So it's sort of mechanisms. So how does childhood biography become adult biology? That's the kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? There's at least four ways. And one of the things, one of the first ways is early life stress. Um, it's basically the number one cause of addiction as well. It, it's, it is actually, I think if you have... Uh, four aces you have you're three to over three times more likely to be a, a smoker over three times as likely to be a binge drinker over seven times as likely to become an alcoholic and over 11 times as likely to, to use injection drugs so this is one of the things we're total misunderstanding about addiction in the sense that we sort of criminalize it and actually everyone's got trauma probably in that group they should be treated for trauma so basically trauma affects behavior so if it affects behavior it causes us to do unhealthy behaviors it causes us to sabotage ourselves so that's one way so early life stress changes our bio biology towards disease through affecting our behavior it all of us have got some level of addiction so whether it's like overt addiction like like i mentioned there or you know addictions to salty foods addictions to sweet foods because we don't feel we've got enough sweetness in our own psyche you know so we'll go after the desserts comfort eating eating our emotions because we haven't resolved the emotional trauma um not feeling like exercising um so all this kind of stuff so it's behavior another way that this is uh, things change is absolutely purely on the biochemistry level so what they've shown is if they, there's something called attachment trauma which is um, a very early life stress where um if you don't have good bonding with mum this is generally it's below the age of about four it's precognitive before the brain comes the full cognitive brain comes online and we're at before age four we're just like a ball of emotion and we kind of we're like a sponge and we, we absorb all the emotions in the room around us and think it's all us we're completely narcissistic all children are below, below age six um so this type of attachment trauma if we don't bond well with our key caregivers that is that's an, that's an ace that's a big ace and it creates a lot of stress in the body and they replicated this with they've done it in uh, animal models rat models mice models and monkey models where they um, replicated the separation between mum and baby at a too young age and what they showed consistently and then they replicated it in humans they proved it in humans as well is that the epigenetic expression, it's actually of the glucocorticoid receptors, it's our stress response changes. Uh, the gut flora changes in these young offspring. Within days, the gut flora changes when you have early life stress, when they separated mum mm. um, from baby too soon. So you've got this, it's actually totally multifactorial. So at the biochemical level, you've got um, this change in epigenetic expression of the corticoid receptors, which means throughout a lifetime less stress causes you to have a stress response so your threshold 
of what causes you to be stressed is lowered. You mm -hmm. basically become hypersensitive to stress. Loads of people can say, yeah, <laughs> they can relate to that. They just know they're overreacting to things all the time. That can actually, the switch, it's an epigenetic switch that can happen. So somebody is set up for that throughout their, the rest of their lives. And that's actually what they found. That was the, one of the top findings because the ACE study triggered lots of research. And that was one of them. So this change in the stress response. But, you know, when we talk about stress, everybody tends to think about the, you know, the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HP axis, the cortisol output and adrenaline. Stress is much stress affects everything it affects the gut as i just mentioned it down regulates the vagus nerve which means that you're much more likely to have leaky gut you won't be absorbing food as well it it suppresses the immune system you're more likely to get bugs it makes the other side of the immune system that reacts to things overreactive so you start getting chemical sensitivity food sensitivities um, it changes the hormones, downregulates the reproductive systems because when you're under survival, reproduction isn't important. Neither is digestion, neither is sleep. So the brain changes, inflammation in the brain. So that the entire immune system, the endocrine system, the gut, that's what stress does. And it also affects the mitochondria. And mitochondria are very important uh, because they're, they're the little cellular engines that there's that it's the engine of every single one of the cell or practically all the cells in the body so all the trillions of cells that you're made up of have this little engine in them called the mitochondria which is, produces atp which is the um the currency the energy currency of the body and very important in anti-aging by the way as well mitochondrial function as i'm sure you're mm -hmm. covering and the, the experts in mitochondrial function know that early life stress switches on what we call the cell danger response, CDR response, which is where the mitochondria switches into defense mode rather than energy mode. So with that, so there was a new discovery. It's Dr. Robert Navio's work, who's one of my heroes, um, ex-president of the, mitochondrial, the Society of Mitochondrial Medicine. And he's literally said CDR, early life stress, switches the mitochondria off. That's why things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia are posted children for people with early life stress. Mm -hmm. So we've got it affects the cellular level, the endocrine, the immune system, everything. Um, they thought it just affected the genetic, epi the epigenetic expression of the stress. Later on, they it, they found it was the epigenetic expression across the entire genome, making you more likely to get all those different chronic illnesses. So we've got behaviour, we've got biochemistry. There's also a nervous system impact of stress, and this is really important. Just because it's the you can't talk about stress without talking about the vagus nerve, which is part of the autonomic nervous system. So the vagus nerve is very important. It's the nerve of compassion. It's the rest, digest, detoxify, feed, breathe. It's the opposite of the fight flight response. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve, it's vagus in Latin means the wandering nerve. And it's because it enervates everything. And it, it causes peristalsis in the gut. So it causes the gut to move food through it. So often people with a low vagal tone get SIBO, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, because the gut's not moving. The reason the gut's not moving is because the vagus nerve is downregulated. The reason is the person had early life stress, they've switched down their vagus nerve and the sympathetic stress response is out of control. So the vagus nerve doesn't connect to the adrenals. It connects to just about everything else. Pancreatic enzyme output, stomach acid output, um, everything, liver. Um, so the vagus nerve is hugely important. It's and it makes us feel good. So the science showing that when we're in an uplifted emotional state, we have high vagal tone. When we have a low heart rate variability, which is a measure of vagal tone, we are in a stress state and we're going to have all those problems with gut, with immunity. Actually, the, the, the number one testing method we have for stress is heart rate variability, HRV. And we want a high HRV and it's a test of vagal tone. It's about the vagus nerve. That's what we're looking at with that. So you can't really talk like, so early life stress down regulates heart rate variability. And this, that's probably the greatest indicator of early mortality rates is if you have heart, a low heart rate variability, low vagal tone, it's a greater predictor of mortality than just about every other factor history of heart disease, history of what medication somebody on, their blood sugar levels. If you have low HRV, it, that's, the, that's the stress and stress kills. Mm. So basically putting it bluntly. So, um, so, that's, so it's the impact on the nervous system. And then I, I, this is the sort of last piece, and I always talk about it's very important, um, the energy field, the energy 
body. So we have um, an energy field around us. We have a photon field. We have an electromagnetic field. We are electric beings. We are not just physical nervous system beings. We have energy field. And if you really think about where does trauma live, I mean, where does trauma exist in the body? Um, it, you see, it leaves a footprint on the biochemistry, and we've talked about that. And it leaves the footprint on the nervous system, and we've talked about that. But where does it actually live? Very likely, it's it's actually as a interruption or um, probably a standing wave that's corrupting the energy field, the bio field, as you could call it. And so, and we'll can get into this when we talk about healing and interventions because we need a multi-factored approach to healing. Um, and anti-aging um, you you want to also clear out the trauma that exists in the energy field now the proof about why we think it's in the energy field if you try and the neuroscientists have never found like where a memory is stored because trauma is a memory like if you cut up a neuron in the brain like do you think you'll find the memory like that's never happened like it, so and memories are not stored in the, the neurons in the brain they're not stored in the synapses like between the neurons so it was actually i think it was carl prebram said one of the great neuroscientists said memories and trauma are probably stored in the field created the electrical field created by all the neurons in the brain firing together mm -hmm. so that's why things like and we'll talk about this with interventions there's an intervention called emdr eye movement desensitization and reprogramming it's not talk therapy. It's got nothing to do with the intellect. It's a complete energy therapy. It's, it's like EFT, the emotional freedom technique. You're tapping on acupuncture points. Some of the most effective interventions are energy medicine and trauma exists in the energy field. So uh, that's why I, the reason I broke that down, like what are all the mechanisms I use for, because people normally need to consider all four if you want to either live forever <laughs> or try to heal from some kind right. of trauma as well. Mm, so, there thank we go. you. That was very comprehensive and we touched, <laughs> touched on so many things. So going back, before we get into techniques and stress reduction and anti-aging, I would love it to take a quick step back because there was something that I wasn't quite sure about. So heart rate variability, could you just explain that a little bit more? So right, it's better, I, I, like, lo I was lost in there and I'm like, okay, so it's better to have a lower or higher heart rate variability? I just have a higher one. So you want, you want more yep. variability. Okay. Yeah. So a, if you have it, like, that's the strange thing. If you have like a more ordered, if it's all very ordered, that's not adaptable. It's like brittle. So you want a high variability between heartbeats and the higher the variability actually, it means resilience and adaptability. Mm -hmm. So we want a high heart rate variability. Yeah. Right. So like I'm thinking back to my exercise physiology background, which has been a long time, but um, I think back to that, right? So obviously also just the variability, right? Where, you know, it, I think studies are still showing that if you have a low resting heart rate, that's your good in the world of, of longevity and stuff, but also you're able to get your heart pumping in an exercise kind of fashion as well. So is that, does that tie into that or is it just like the space between one heartbeat and the next? So that's, those are separate markers of okay. looking at the heart function in a different way mm -hmm. um, specifically heart rate variability has been you see the vagus nerve will control heartbeat so it's that, that that's why heart rate variability specifically is looking at um, a vagal tone vagal tone whereas if you've got a low heart um, sort of think about the heart also pumps you know blood all around the body so if you are not very fit and your mitochondria aren't it's such a great you start to get high blood pressure and things like that which isn't which isn't good and then you start to get a high resting heart rate and all that so the, the hearts have to work really hard so the healthier you are the you know the lower the, the slower your heart beats is within reason obviously because it'd be too much right. but it's the vagus nerve the vagus nerve is like a homeostatic control over a whole how fast you're breathing and like so we could talk about this like one of the best ways to improve vagal tone is long exhales so the vagus nerve controls the the heart rate variability the 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 distance the time between heart uh, beats how it's all kinds of things all these kind of homeostatic controls so you've got um the brain stem is and the kind of the brain is like monitoring everything like going this person's breathing too fast okay send the message to the vagus nerve to slow uh, to to kind of speed up or slow down breath rate or speed up and slow or slow down 
the blood pressure or a, um, a heart rate and so on. So that's the kind of connection. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was just, I, my mind was going into all these areas of the heart rate. So that, okay, got it. So, okay, let's talk about techniques. Like what, what can people obviously watching right now are interested in learning about how to reduce stress in their life from, you know, past childhood experiences that are creating them to potentially age faster or have, you know, disease processes, that kind of stuff. So what, what can we do to slow that process, stop that process? What are your thoughts? Yeah. I'll let, we can cover like, we can cover like three different areas. Like what's some, a few things still in the biochemistry, a few things still in the nervous system and then a few things on the energy field because we are multi factorial beings. So we don't just want to reduce ourselves down to being just biochemical or, or just energetic either. Right. So, um, at the biochemical level, there's two things that are very practical that people are, that's so foundational and psychologists are picking this up. Like every psychologist who's working with anxiety, PTSD, all that stuff should know about this because it will, it will really help their practice. But circadian rhythm management is one of the top things that you can do that could probably get rid of 50% of anxiety and stress just overnight so we are um we have clock genes we have genes in our body that are responding to environmental signals and there are four key signals um nutritional timing exposure to sunlight um temperature and activity like act exercise levels is four and we just we in this industrial world we're living in we are totally out of whack we've got very out of tune with you know our gene our genes have this 24-hour cycle and the genes it's the for example light light will pass through the eye down the optic nerve it will speak to the hypothalamus and actually say okay it's time to turn on thyroid or if it's morning or it's time to to turn off or to turn on melatonin at night and the eyes are going okay it's sunlight uh, no melatonin let's have cortisol up okay it's now dark okay so now we need more melatonin and uh, by the way growth hormone switch that on please so um the hormones there's, there's a whole set of hormones something called autophagy which is cellular debris cleaning up that happens at night um autophagy is massively important for anti-aging like it's the probably the number one things to trigger autophagy which means uh, stimulating the cells it's basically if you don't have autophagy you're living off yesterday's proteins so at night autophagy clears out all the cellular rubbish mm -hmm. but it can only happen if you're sleeping so sleep is like number one for anti-aging and it's linked to circadian rhythm. Like it's the number one reason why people aren't sleeping is lack of circadian rhythm. So here's some tips of some of the most important things you could do to get your circadian rhythm fully in track. And you can heal adrenal fatigue just by these things. I would say I start to go to bed. I actually would, I'm still a 9.30 at night person. Yeah, if you're going to yeah, <laughs> nine thirty at night. Go to bed when it's dark, and the earlier the better. Those couple of hours of sleep before bed it can make a world of difference. But it's also you're bringing your body into alignment with with then when you wake up and then it's sunlight. You've got the you want it, you first thirty minutes on waking. You should really get sunlight. If you're lucky enough to live somewhere where you can go straight outside and get sunlight, or be by a window and the sunlight's coming in, great. Uh, you can get these uh, SAD lamps for like 40 bucks or something on Amazon, the SAD lamp, seasonal affective disorder. That's white light. And you can just, I just have one of those and I just switch it on first thing in the morning, get the light in uh, because it's not always sunny outside and anybody in the UK and places like that, like me to, they'll always say like, Oh my God, make sure there's enough to hose. It's like, we don't have any sun. We're going to have terrible circadian rhythm. No, just I, I lived in Seattle for a few years uh, during grad school. So I had those lights. I have not, I got rid of them when I moved, but I, I never thought, cause it, it's very sunny here in North Carolina, but, but yeah, that's a, it's definitely not sunny right when I wake up most mornings cause I'm up early. So yes uh -huh. so these simple things it's the simple things that we're talking about but they could be absolutely life-changing where people just have to do them like go to bed at 9 30 get up and the first thing you do is 30 minutes of bright light natural or get one of the sad lamps try not to eat if you can if you've got good blood sugar control don't eat three hours before bed mm -hmm. these are simple simple things that you can do and make the bulk of your activity for the first thing in the morning there's so many things you can do for circadian rhythm. You also want complete darkness at night. Switch all the EMFs off. Switch all the electricity off in, in the house. You can. I've got people who switch things off at the light box. Definitely turn the Wi-Fi off at night. Get your phone away from you. Put it on airplane if you use it. 
um, or if, so, if someone can transform their life just doing those few simple things, their life would be transformed. And so people are like, oh, I can't do it. Well, you, do you want to live longer or not kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So circadian rhythm management, I've just given you at least five practical things that can be life changing if you just did them. You're, you're sending all these messages to the body about, oh, I'm supposed to be doing autophagy. And by the way, the brain detoxifies at night. If you have crap sleep, it's one of the top things, actually, if you are a night shift worker or you have bad sleep, you're not in circadian rhythm, you have dramatic short, you'll have a shortened lifespan. So you need to start to think sleep is vital and circadian rhythm, tons you can do on that. It's great. So the other thing that I would say is important and it's so important only because most people's vagus nerve is out of whack right now, but a diet to manage blood sugar. So you want a sort of a, a diet that manages blood sugar control. This is the, I can change somebody's life by doing the circadian rhythm and eat a diet I, I suppose paleo is the quickest, fastest, guaranteed way to kind of see if it's going to help be helpful for you or not. There's also the most resources online. So you've got like whole30.com, I think it is, whole30, W-H-O-L-E 30.com. They've got like a 30-day program and it's, I think millions of people have done it now. And it's just, try, you try out paleo for a month if you haven't done it already and um, see if that doesn't uh, change your life as well. The protein for breakfast, getting all the processed and refined foods out of the diet, protein also at lunch and dinner, but you can kind of increase the carb a little bit by the evening time. We need a little bit of carb at night because it boosts things like serotonin, it relaxes us. Um, but just, you can experiment with that. But paleo is like the fast track to doing like uh, blood sugar control. It, this is another thing where you can, People are more anxious and depressed if they don't sleep at night. And they're also anxious and depressed if their blood sugar is on a roller coaster ride mm -hmm. because they're eating, they're looking for the caffeine and the sugar hit in the artificial stimulants. You're just on a roller coaster. So somebody's circadian rhythm is out of whack and their blood sugar is all over the place. I wouldn't want to work with someone like that on a psychology mm -hmm. level because I know all well, that's out of whack and I can't tell what's going on with the person. Like, is this the blood sugar and feeling hangry speaking? Or is it, is it actually a genuine trauma for the past, you know? So you could clear 50% of things just by getting those types of things done. So that's two things on the biochemistry level. Uh, nervous system level, it should become a way of life to stimulate the vagus nerve. Uh, the vagal toe, it's like, eat, how long should I eat vegetables for to be healthy? Forever? Like, it's, it's right. the same, same with vagal tone. There are tons of ways to stimulate the vagus nerve. They need to become part of your lifestyle so there's i could say like 40 different ways of stimulating the vagus nerve uh, deep breathing all the different types of deep breathing is probably number one things like um even left and right nostril the left nostril breathing just deep exhales yogic breathing lion breath all those kind of yogic types all, all of them have been shown to increase hrv heart rate variability so breath is probably one of the top ones meditation definitely works if you can find that you're too traumatized to meditate, don't worry. It's actually contraindicated for some people, but if you can meditate, it will increase your heart rate variability. So will things like Qigong, if that's better suited to you. Yoga is a massive one will increase heart rate variability. It's really like, what do you enjoy? Singing, chanting, laughter, uplifting things, not horror movies or anything like that, but uplifting YouTube's funny cat movies on YouTube, that type of thing. Um, so uh, positive social relations, uh, positive emotional states, gratitude, uh, gratitude journaling, um, everything that feeds the soul actually increases heart rate variability. Um, so all those kind of massage is wonderful. Time in nature is massive. Essential oils, uh, even vegetable juicing will work as well. Uh, essential fatty acids, um, omega-3 oils. So there's quite a lot of bottom up and top down. Most psychotherapies will increase heart rate variability. Uh, EFT, EMDR, I mentioned it. So most psychotherapies, if it's working, it should increase vagal tone. So I have like what you could call a miracle morning where you could do four things, just choose four things in the morning that you do that increases vagal tone. It, you could do them one minute each if you've got no time, or if you've got 30 minutes, do them for 30 minutes. So you might start with a 10 minute meditation. You could do some gratitude journaling, set the intentions for the day, uh, go and do some stretching, bit of yoga. And if you're lucky enough and you can get outside and do some exercise outside, that's your four for the day. So you're setting up your vagal tone every day. By the way, that's, these are all the foundation things that people 
could do that this will lengthen your life and make you more healthy um but also they should be the foundation things if, if you've got ptsd if you've got trauma these are the foundations that you should have in place to then go and see us it will improve what you do with the psychotherapist type of thing you know the therapist as well so uh make bagel toned stimulation in a way of life uh and any kind of compassion meditation as well is awesome um, and then the last thing is, I suppose, the energetic side. So taking care of the energy field. Um, and I've mentioned EMDR and EFT as some of the top things you can do for trauma. Uh, my favorite therapy right now, absolutely love it. I think it's going to be massive. I think it's going to be bigger than EMDR and the rest of it is um, sound therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, biofield tuning. Um, I'm a big fan of Eileen McCusick. I've trained in her work, some of her work up to sort of foundation level in her training. I think that biofield tuning, tuning fork therapy um, has completely transformed me and it's one of the most accessible ways. And it's not doing, it's not a panacea, but it's definitely uh, one of the best ways to clear out uh, the trauma that is, is disrupting the coherency of the waves we're talking about we sort of go from biochemistry to physics we talk about the energy field it's all about waves and coherence in the waves um so that's where heart math talk about a coherent heart rate where there's your heartbeat as well so um so having a coherent field means that trauma actually or stress will cause the incoherence so sound therapy breaks up the incoherency in the energy field um, so that type of thing is absolutely wonderful grounding being connected to earth both energetically and physically time in nature is you can't there's so many science papers or i thought i could just listen to so many science papers on what happens time in nature it's, it's got a special name in japanese and so um can't you can't get enough time in nature it's like if you want to live for a good period of time also i would say yeah we are energetically all connected to each other as well so and our field will tend to synchronize with those around us so if somebody's very out of balance and incoherent and you're spending time with that person a lot of time with that person it will constantly pull you down mm -hmm. so that's probably the impact of other people like op other people is massive on your overall health and longevity and well-being if you look at like blue zones and everything the social interactions is all very important but that's probably as a huge factor is the quality of your social relations so you know if you have somebody you're living with somebody and perhaps they are perhaps they're mentally unwell for example it's not to say you're suddenly going to abandon that person but you have to take into account the impact that that's having on you so it's the self-care piece and being aware that you will get run down to the point where you won't be able to care for other people if you don't take care of yourself um, so we call them energy vampires it's a kind of a bit uh -huh. of a provocative term uh, but there are those things are real um yeah that ask the chief scientific officer of heart math um uh, mccrady he's he, i interviewed him and he said yeah he'll show you look here's the <laughs> here's the heart rate reliability testing so that's the other major sort of uh, awareness for people to have and the last thing kind of on the energy field that we are energy beings more connected and you at the more energetically sensitive that you get the more you'll realize you've taken on somebody else's emotions that person's sending you stuff and it's attached to you and it has a massive impact so um yeah get rid of the energy vampires yep it certainly does awesome thank you that was amazing so we got we have biochemical we have nervous system we have the energetic field and so many tips and tools and strategies within all of that hey one question that i wanted to ask you after um, the first one, biochemical, what does turning your phone on airplane mode do so that it doesn't affect your sleep? So when you have the phone on and it's constantly a looking for the signal to connect with whether it's 4G and now, of course, we have 5G as well. Mm -hmm. um, that is you've got that is, you know, it's a man made electromagnetic field. You have that is a field and fields are you know we are electric beings like i just said we and we have fields we have a, the field around the heart is a hundred times stronger than the field around the brain um you can measure fields it's scientifically absolutely validated that we have these electromagnetic fields 
And, you know, we used to, people don't understand about the electromagnetic spectrum. I think you talk about electromagnetism and people probably think about the ionizing, like radiation, which is like really bad and destroys your DNA and all that. And that's like, you know, to do with nuclear radiation. Mm -hmm. But then we've got healthy radiation, like light therapy is great. Um, You know, we need light. We need the sunlight. Sometimes we need blue light. Uh, Oh, we should be blocking blue light in the evening, get the orange blocking glasses. That's another tip, circadian rhythm. So, you know, we've got an infrared is really good. So, and then we, we used to have a big empty space, right? And then right at the bottom, we have the Schumann resonance, like all the way down at the very, very low frequency. The opposite of ionizing radi- radiation is the Schumann frequency, which is the natural electromagnetic fields produced by the earth. Mm. And us beings, you know, alpha wave brain is the Schumann re- re- um, resonance, the so 7.5, 7.43, I think it is hertz. The body needs that. We are magnetic beings. So we used to be empty between the the visible light spectrum and Mm. Schumann resonance. And now we've got dumped in cell phone radiation. We've got Wi-Fi dumped in there, all man-made stuff. And there are already thousands of scientists coming out confirming, you know, it's uh, increase in autism rates linked to this. Um, And essentially, I mean, I'm super sensitive now because energetically sensitive, but if I leave my Wi-Fi on at night, I'm, I don't, I cannot get into a restful, as as a restful sleep. So it's like, it's a stressor. It's just like having a toxin that's a stressor or a stressful husband or wife. It's a stressor. It's like, like that. That's what the Wi-Fi is doing. It's like, it's stimulating the cortisol and the sympathetic side of the nervous system. That's what it's doing. Um, And so so that's why we are not fans of, of kind of Wi-Fi and the cell phones, Apart from all the surveillance is probably happening as well, but um, <laughs> so it's yeah, we just we want to absolutely minimise that, and especially you know pregnant women like that's and children. You don't want there's massive studies done of children below the age of seven in Sweden and Norway and the Nordic countries showing that um, IQ levels are lower and le- slower learning with children that have been exposed to Wi-Fi at early, an early age. And, the, you know, mm. cell phones have already been classified by the World Health Organization as possibly carcinogenic. If you ask the experts who've done the research, like, nah, it's not possibly, it's definitely. Um, but you've got the telecommunications industry who, you know, funnily enough, if you look at the data done on cell phones, it's if it's an independent researcher, it's like 75% is like and bad for your health and of course the telecommunications it's the opposite it's like oh yeah 75 percent safe only a quarter issue so mm-hmm. uh, yeah some funding is some you know yes who's funding the research studies always, is always always a good question to ask and <laughs> don't cherry pick when it's like oh no but i heard this study showing it's safe who funded mm-hmm. it and what was it cherry picked and what's the whole picture mm-hmm. always look at the whole picture so yeah that's a bit about got it thank we're you we're not fans of bmfs yeah okay. Awesome. Thank you. This is just awesome. I appreciate everything. You you shared so many amazing tips and strategies and, and I want you to talk about your free gift. So everyone, there is a button below this video that leads over to Nikki's free gift. So, so what is this? It's my ebook on the seven steps to healing uh, childhood emotional trauma. Uh, and I go through it. So you've got m- many more links and uh, connections to things, uh, more references, science references, basically behind everything we talked about today, really. And, um, when you sign up to that you could you also get signed up optionally if you like to my newsletter as well you can stay in touch and when i'm on other summits or i have um other programs coming out later in the year welcome to stay in touch with that or unsubscribe if you don't want to it's totally up to you (laughs) (laughs) but yeah so it's a free free ebook great thank you so much and are there any last insights anything else you want to leave people with before we wrap up um love is medicine the body knows how to heal itself um that's probably if this if that's the proof where we talk about trauma and stress the opposite of fear trauma and stress is you know feeling good if you health means feeling good and if you're not feeling good um you're not going to live as long and it's going to affect your physical body as well so it's it really is um self-love self-love deficit is really the foundation of all trauma so um ultimately loving to love learning to love yourself is what will give you that sense of safety and that actually it allows the body to heal itself. So I'll leave that with a little bit of yeah. wisdom. <laughs> awesome. Small Thank piece of wisdom. You. Yeah, just a tiny piece. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. I really appreciate this. You've been a delight to talk to and a wealth of information. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thanks very much, Andy. And thank you for the work that you're doing to help a lot of people as well. 
Absolutely. Our pleasure. And everyone watching or listening right now, thank you so much for showing up for yourself, for, for being here, willing to learn and willing to open up your mind to new tips, tools, and strategies to help you on your aging journey as a human being on this earth. And we will see you again soon. Thanks so much.